Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So have you been seeing some of these viral plant hacks online and are thinking, hmm, would they work on my houseplant? Are they meant to be just for gardening? I thought let's run a quick experiment today and test some of these hacks out and see what we come up with. So this is going to be probably the beginning part one of a two-part series, one being the experiment today and the second part will be updating on the results. So let me just explain what I'm going to be doing in this video. I'm going to be doing three if not four, I think it's just three experiments, and I'm going to talk you through what each one of them is in each section. I'm going to show you what I'm doing and explain what the thought process or the theory is behind some of these hacks. And I say hacks throughout this video, most of these things work in certain scenarios. I'm just going to try them in slightly different scenarios and see how we get along. Some of these have been going around in the gardening world for years. And I know some people have experimented doing it with a few houseplants, but I want to try it in a different way. So obviously it's important, as we all know, to do experiments like this on a regular basis. We all do them anyway. You might not be filming yours and doing it in this kind of format, but it's important because we can learn new things or new tricks that we can do to further enhance our house plants. Sometimes faster, not always, sometimes for bigger plants, not always. But the experiments that I want to be talking about or basically going through today are one, testing something that is called a uh, cakey paste, and I'll see if I can bring it in a bit closer, it's probably going to need flipping on the screen, but cakey paste is essentially just a glorified way of introducing a hormone, if I'm not mistaken, called cytokinin into kind of plants, and I'll touch on that in, that in its own section. Then I'm going to be looking at reflective mulch, and some people might be finding that quite an interesting one, because some people might have heard about the cakey paste, but reflective mulch I don't think I've heard a lot of people talk about. And the other one that I'm going to be talking about is something called notching. And I'll go into these in more detail in each one of the sections, but yeah, shall we dive into the first one? So let's start off with the cakey paste. So the cakey paste, and I'm trying to take it out of its box essentially, it usually not always, this one that I've got came with some uh, spreading sticks, very similar to kind of ice lolly sticks, and <laughs> that whole packaging for this much product basically. So I'll bring it in so you can kind of see the amount that we're talking about there. It's not an awful lot, and it is a paste, and it isn't cheap, so I will say that. I got this from Amazon, and I'll link it down below. I got this from Amazon, and I think it was 15 Great British Pounds, so not the cheapest thing. I was trying to see if I could find cheaper alternatives on Amazon. It might have just been because I have seen this in the past, and they were cheaper versions. This time around I couldn't find one, this was the only one, and I was even trying to find if I could find cytokinin on its own basically and do it that way, would that be cheaper if it wasn't just called cakey paste? I couldn't find it this time around. There was a lot of results that came up that were not cytokinin, so I got rooting hormone, I got a few other bits and bobs, but when you looked at the ingredients they did not have cytokinin. So cytokinin, I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce it. But, so essentially what it meant is I just ended up buying this cakey paste. And for the people that don't know what a cakey paste is originally used for, and I'll see if I can add some videos here so you can see what I'm talking about. It's usually something that people have used for predominantly orchids, and predominantly a lot of people will use this on their Phalaenopsis orchids. And generally what it does is you would peel back the a flappy little section from the node on orchid flowering spike, generally speaking, and you would slather some of this using 
something like a brush or something like these sticks. I'm assuming the sticks are coming with because this is probably quite thick. I've not used one of these before. I bought cakey paste years ago and I never used it and it's expired. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to bite the bullet and do it. Um, and you would spread it onto that node and it should, theoretically, this is what the theory is behind cakey paste or specifically the cytokinin hormone, it should either activate another bloom spike on the orchid or new a new little plantlet starting on the actual flower spike itself so you can then get a plant off the back of it. The way that I'm going to be using this and how I'm going to experiment with it is I have got, and I will show you, and ironically enough, this is the best one out of a really bad bunch. So the people that have been here when I was doing my conservatory update, before I painted all the windows with the peelable paint, there was a corner, and it's still the corner, called the Epiplemnum corner, at least I've called it that, because I put all my pothosy type plants there. They all fried because of the sun. So they've obviously lost a lot of leaves and you might be able to see a lot of bare stem. So what I want to see in one of the one of the experiments with the cakey paste that I want to do, and you can see some of the older kind of crispy leaves that happened when it was getting sun scorched essentially. I should be doing this before the video, but no, I'm doing it now. I will pick things up afterwards. But is that it lost quite a few of the leaves. So I do want to see if I can stimulate some growth by adding some of that to these nodes. What I also want to do is, I'm not going to leave the experiment just there. And I will say this, I will preface this when it comes to all of these experiments. They're not the most scientific way of doing it because I should have the test plant and I should exactly in the same conditions have a secondary plant and I will use that as a control without having the cake paste and see what it does. But with the cakey paste, I don't know whether or not that's going to make much of a difference because the cakey paste is, I have never seen a situation with any of my pothosy type plants or my epipremnum type plants where they will reactivate a node if they've dropped the leaf. So that it will continue growing from the growing tip there and get new leaves on this end. But very rarely have I ever had it activate on here, if ever actually, at least in my experience. So with the cakey paste, I'm, I don't know whether I'll need a control because I'll put it on and if it gets it, it worked. If it doesn't, it didn't work. It's as simple as that basically, but I won't just leave it to this plant. I will show you predominant on this one because it'll be easier for me to show you during the video, but what I will also be doing is also testing it out on runner nodes from my Monstera Oblica Peru because it's doing okay, but it's starting to run <laughs> considerably. Anybody who's got a Monsero Oblique of Peru, and I'm hoping there's more of you now because they've become a lot more available, the, the runner situation is real. So I want to see if this will help it activate. The other plant that I'm going to be trying it on, and it's difficult for me to bring it out now, it's in the back on one of the shelves, is on an Amedrium medium. And that's another one that tends to run. It's another one that I've had a bit of struggles with it. It's lost some of its leaves. I think it's down to its last leaf and I keep cutting the runners off and trying to propagate them. And nah, 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 nah. I want to see if the cakey paste will work with that specific plant. Now, without further ado, let's try it, shall we? So opening it up, it is quite a thick paste. Does it have a smell? Sorry, I'm one of those weird people that smells everything. It smells a bit waxy, if that makes sense. So bringing this in, and I know other people have done cakey experiments, and if you've had good success with yours or bad success, let me know. So I will take a tiny amount and I will hide my face so you can see about that much. And let's see about getting it onto the mandula pothos that I was showing you a moment ago. So what I want to do essentially is go onto the node and around the node, just put some of that paste. And I'm going to do a couple of things on this one. So in this experiment, I want to have one area where I'm going to add multiple sections of cakey paste to see if that works or if that's going to overdo it for the plant and it might sacrifice that specific node. And then on another one, 
I want to just try doing one node and see if that works. So I've done three nodes here to see how that works. And let's have a look. So if I go to this branch here, and this one does have a lot of white, I'm trying to see maybe another one that doesn't have as much white. Right, so this one has got some green, and I will see if I can activate one node further up. I don't know if I'm using the right amount, I'm just slathering it on and seeing. Because the theory here is too much of a good thing might also be problematic. So one has quite a bit on it, and let's see how that goes. And the other one just has the one node that has got the KQ paste. This will go and live now with all my other epipremnums in that corner. It will still keep getting the same kind of light levels that it's used to. I think, as far as I could tell, that's everything that I need to do in order to be able to test the KQ paste. So, <laughs> uh, for all my techie, like, best friends who are just like, read the damn manual. I'm reading the damn manual after I've done it, obviously. Because why would I do it beforehand? But yes, this is kind of saying the same thing. It's, it's kind of apply it to the node and let it be essentially. And within a few weeks, it's saying you should either get a new flower spike or a new orchid growing. This is obviously, this is predominantly used for orchids. It does also say that you can use this type of paste on things like Hoya, Monstera, Kalanchoe, and Stephania, and Violets. Stephania is an interesting one. I hadn't thought about doing this on a, something like a Stephania erector, basically. That might be an interesting one. I didn't know that you could do it with that one. But though obviously what it's saying is it takes roughly about three to four weeks, specifically for orchids, so it might take less time or more time depending on the type of plants that you put it on. And it's also saying that this will really only predominantly work if you do it on a healthy plant. So if a plant is struggling with any of the techniques that I'm talking about today, maybe don't do that because you're adding an extra parameter that might stress it out. This needs to be done on healthy plants, all of these experiments that I'm talking about now. It is also saying that with the cakey paste, obviously if it's really warm, it's, it's made out of waxes or kind of oils. So that's why it was smelling the way that it was smelling, I think. So saying if it starts melting and it's very, very hot, you might be better off putting that container back into like a fridge for a couple of hours so it can set and then doing it that way, basically. So coming on to the second experiment, <laughs> and I will be using this very, very pathetic looking philodendron white princess, which I only realized when I picked it up that it's got a bit of pink. So it's technically a tricolor, which is what they're talking about. I don't know whether or not that happened. I don't think that was always pink. I would have noticed it, I think, <laughs> a bit sooner. I am not the most observant person on the planet, so. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, a bit pathetic. I took this cutting last year and this is the most it's been able to do. It's been in semi hydro, didn't like it. It was in water, didn't like it. I've put it in soil. It's liking it a bit more. So I'm kind of leaving it in a net pot and hoping for the best, basically. You might be able to see the original stem cutting, how big that was and how small that has become. But I'm curious, before I go on about what notching is, has anybody tried notching? I know for houseplants, sometimes people try notching things like ficuses usually, so things like a fiddle leaf fig. I'll wait for a few seconds. Have you? Just drop a comment down below if you tried it, and if so, did it work or did it not, basically. So let me talk to you a bit more about what the concept of notching is. So notching is something that gardeners have done for a while. The other thing that I will say quite quickly when it comes to notching, at least from what I could see online, it's not foolproof. None of these methods really are. They are just things that you could potentially experiment with and see if they work for you or not. So notching is something that you would do, and I'm trying to not use the knife on camera because I think it, YouTube has issues with that basically. I don't know how I'm gonna be able to display it otherwise, but what you might be able to see is if I go here, what the notching will do is you will cut at a 45 degree angle, kind of getting to about a third of the way into the plant, basically into the stem. It needs to be above a node. 
And what that does is essentially it releases that apical dominance. And I've talked about apical dominance on a previous video, and I'll see if I can link it at the top there. Essentially, apical dominance is the fact that the plant will always grow from its growing tip. So if you take a cutting, for instance, if I was to cut this plant and take the entire top off, that would release the apical dominance back into the plant, which would then re allocate some of its energies towards some of these other nodes, which essentially are dormant nodes at this point, or nodes that have not activated, to activate to create a new apical point, or multiple sometimes. So the theory behind this, and this is why a lot of the times, at least in houseplants, has been done on ficuses, ficuses a lot of the times tend to grow on a single stem and they grow quite tall. And then you can also sometimes find ficuses that have branched. And I can't remember if one of them is called the standard form which might be the one that starts to branch and look a bit like a tree, and the other one, I don't know exactly what the terminology is. There is a terminology within the kind of retail part of that world where they kind of distinguish the columnar ones with the ones that are branched. But that is something that they do a lot of the times there in order to activate a, a node underneath because, again, it releases that apical dominance. I'd be curious to see what it does to the top growth, whether or not that stops it entirely and then creates the branch and whether or not you just need to keep notching. I've seen a couple of people do this online and when they've made cuts, for instance, I've seen them try this on Monstera and when I went back to find the original video who had posted that, I think it was on TikTok, I don't think I ever saw an update. So I don't know whether or not it ever worked or whether or not they just forgot to do an update. But I will be trying it on this. The other thing as well that I can see from my research is you don't want to be doing it on exceptionally woody stems. And you also don't want to be doing it on very, very thin stems. Because the problem that you might get with very, very thin stems, and this is kind of bordering a bit on that, is you might go too deep or you might cut the plant off entirely at the top, which kind of defeats the purpose of keeping that growth and making it branch out. You can also do multiple notches, but I think that takes away some of the success rate because then the plant is trying to like activate quite a few nodes and it might not be able to. So I will only be doing the one notch on this specific plant and seeing how it goes. That original video that I saw on TikTok, also they put something in like a plastic card or a paper card into that notch to keep it open because I would imagine either they were doing it on a Monstera though as well rather than a ficus but a ficus would have that latex that would come out which do not touch it it can be quite irritating on your skin um, but and I'm pretty sure with the philodendrons it might be similar as well but yeah it's it's just to keep that wound open enough so that apical dominance is released. I won't be doing it for this experience with putting something in. If it then fails or doesn't do anything, I might then try it with something like a card to keep that wound open. So unfortunately, I'm going to do this off camera because YouTube and knives don't go well together, but I will show you the notch in just a second. Before I do that, obviously sterilize all your equipment. So either run it under a flame or spray some rubbing alcohol on it. And with this, realistically, it's either gonna be a knife that you're gonna be using or a blade. It won't be scissors, because scissors have more of a crushing kind of action on the actual stem itself. Okay, so the notch has happened. Whether or not this is gonna come up on camera, I don't know. You might be able to see some of that kind of sap seeping out there. And you can see now why they put the card. Hopefully that cut is coming through and you can see kind of where it ends. Let me see if I can move it to the other side as well. So you might be able to see that there. There you go. You can kind of hopefully see the cut. So what that will do now is release that apical dominance. And I'm not entirely sure when I was looking at this, whether or not it's going to activate the node above or the node below in order for it to branch out. Obviously, you can see that the sap coming out of that cut, which is Again, the main reason why, as always, keep your materials sterilized as much as possible because essentially you are introducing a cut, you might be introducing pathogens. That is the other thing I will say with this. This is risky because even if you've done everything right, you might still be introducing pathogens into the specific plant, which might ultimately kill it or really kind of hamper its growth. You can understand now why I said earlier on that you need to do any of these experiments 
on healthy plants. Because doing anything like this and introducing potentially pathogens, if it's a plant that's already struggling, it might kill it off. The same thing goes with the keiki paste. Granted, you're not introducing anything into the actual plant itself, but I don't know, I've never used keiki paste before. It might be in a high humidity environment like this that it might attract kind of spores of mold or fungus or anything like that. So do at your own risk. And it's also part of the reason why I've done it on some of the plants that I'm less fussed about losing. Yes, the cakey paste on the Monstera oblique proof, it kind of like doesn't go well. I might have some issues with that. But again, as I mentioned, <laughs> bizarre to be saying this years later, it's a lot more easily available these days. It's not cheap, cheap yet, but it's a bit more affordable. So if I need to replace it, I probably can at this point. So bear that in mind. And what I've also seen about the notching method is on average, there's a whole bunch of websites online that are saying kind of conflicting figures. You're looking at about a 30 to 50% success rate. That was figures that I was looking at when I was looking at fiddle leaf fix. So I don't know if this is gonna be any worse or better off, but we shall have to wait and see, shan't we? So I've left the easiest little hack for last and also potentially the one that maybe not everybody has heard of, which is reflective mulch for plants. The mulch is something we don't generally talk about when we're talking about house plants. It's generally more for the outdoor plants, but I'm pretty sure when I saw this, this really would only apply hugely towards house plants. So let me show you and this one I'll be able to do a bit more of a proper experiment with because I've got two Epipremnum pinnatums. They're both right next to each other. They're both in a semi-hydro mix and they're both in a water reservoir. But you can kind of see, and where I've got them, they're not getting the best level of light for both of them. So, and this is gonna be a risky one with these two because potentially the experiment might spill over to both of them. So I don't know quite how I'm gonna do it. Maybe I might need to separate them and just put them close enough to each other, but not that close. But let me explain what reflective mulch is and what it does. And it's about to get loud and I do apologize potentially because I've got fans going around. The room currently is 34 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and I've got windows of things open, but all the fans are on me, which is blowing the tinfoil that I wanted to show you. But reflective mulch is pretty much what you might imagine it is. It's adding something like tinfoil or aluminum foil, I think it's called as well in some places, cutting it, slicing it, and putting it over the growing media, because essentially what you're wanting to do is reflect some of that light going towards that plant and getting lost potentially on a dark media or something like that, back onto the plant. And it's the same concept that some people might have seen if you, and I'll try to move this away so it doesn't flap around in the wind that much. It's the same concept that if you put a plant next to a very white wall, it will reflect some of the light coming in from potentially a window where you've got it close to it. Or if you've got mirrors behind the plant, it will kind of utilize, it won't be the same level of light that's coming in from the window, but it will be a reduced version of that still coming back, on, bouncing off the mirror and coming back onto the plant. It's the same concept with this. So if I just show you really quickly what I've done there is I've just, there's nothing fancy. I've just added the tinfoil on top of the growing media so that any light that's going in that area is being reflected back towards the plant. Now, obviously I did say, and I said in the previous section again, make sure that the plant is healthy. Yes, make sure that the plant is healthy with this, but out of the three methods, I would imagine this is the less risky one if your plant isn't 100% happy because essentially you're introducing more light. Yes, there is the risk that if the plant is sun-stressed and you're adding even more light, you're gonna make things worse, essentially. This is one potentially for plants that are in very, very hidden corners. Obviously you're adding tinfoil on top of a plant. I'm thinking of all the people that put tinfoils over the windows and doors so that the, the rays don't get to them. You might come across a Slightly kooky, but, <laughs> and it doesn't look the greatest thing in the world, potentially, but 
I'm doing it as a fun experiment to see if it makes a bit of a difference. These plants are kind of tucked away in a corner under a shelf. They're getting a lot of shade essentially and most epipremnums don't mind this. But I am curious to see if it's going to make a bit of a difference to utilize as much of that light and reflect it back on the plant. Again, I will state this because I'm sure some of you will say this in the comment, it doesn't look like the best thing in the world. The cakey paste you can't really see, the notch you can't really see. There is no missing the fact that you put tinfoil over the growing media of your plant if somebody comes into your house and sees this. No two ways around it. But if it's something that you can do and just kind of have it for your plants that are tucked somewhere in the corner or ones that you don't mind, people seeing it for like a few months until that plant kind of boosts its leaf production and gets a lot of light, then you could always remove it at some point as well. The other thing that I'm thinking of, based on the fact that this tin foil is sitting on top of the growing media, is that to a certain point, it will relieve some of that evaporation aspect of it as well. So you're, you're obviously, it doesn't matter what growing media you've got, whether or not it's semi-hydro or whether or not it's an aroid soil mix, you will get some evaporation happening from those higher levels of the substrate because it's exposed to kind of air and light and all of these things. That tinfoil is obviously going to keep some of that down. So there is something to be said about that. Whether or not, and I'm thinking about this now, whether or not this could be done with something that's a bit more decorative that might be an interesting one because I'm thinking of now, and I don't know what they're called, those drops of glass that you get the decorative and you can kind of put them in places around your house. I'll see if I can find a picture possibly and add it here so it kind of makes a bit more sense. Some of those I think have got mirror finishes on that and that you could probably put on top of the soil of your plant and still get some of that reflective behavior going back into the plant without you being the crazy person like me that has got tinfoil over <laughs> the plant's growth media, you know? But yeah, so this is the less risky one as well, but this is a fun one to kind of experiment with. You don't have to get cakey paste, you don't have to notch something if you're worried that it might kill it off potentially and maybe not get much of a reaction from the plant. This is one that's a relatively straightforward thing. Most people will have tin foil or aluminum foil, uh, aluminium foil, uh, um, in your house. So might be a fun one to experiment. Again, for the plants specifically that are not getting that much light where they are, and they probably would appreciate a bit more light. Obviously, this is not one that you want to put somewhere in like a south facing window. You might want to, I'm kind of revising my thought of this. You might want to for something like a cactus or a succulent that needs an awful lot of light, but maybe even the brightest window that you're giving it isn't giving it enough light. But again, you're going to be seeing tin foil from the outside when people look into your house. You do you, basically. <laughs> but yeah, that was the experiment being set up. I think based on kind of time frames for all of these things, I probably will do a follow-up video in maybe a month, month and a half's time, and see if there's any been any real differences with this. But did any of these kind of methods surprise you? Or have you tried any of these and have you had your own results? I'd be really curious as well as probably everybody else. Drop a comment down below and let us all know. But if any of this works, I'd be really curious to kind of try it with a few more of my plants, especially I've got high hopes for the cakey paste. Um, but yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.